Chapter Nine of Murder at Bridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Murder at Bridge by Anne Austen. Chapter Nine. For the first time during the difficult interview, Dundee was sure that Lydia Carr was lying. For a fraction of a second, her single eye wavered, the lid flickered. Then came her harsh, flat denial. I didn't see nobody. I presume your basement room has a window looking out upon the back garden, Dundee persisted. Yes, it has, but I didn't waste no time looking out of it, Lydia answered grimly. I was laying down with an ice cap against my jaw. She had seen someone, Dundee told himself, but the truth would be harder to extract from that stern, scar-twisted mouth than the abscessed tooth had been. Finally, when her lone eye did not again waver under his steady gaze, he dismissed her, or rather, returned her to Captain Strawn's custody. "'Well, Janet, I hope you're satisfied,' Penny Crane said bitingly, as she dashed unashamed tears from her brown eyes. "'If ever a maid was absolutely crazy about her mistress—' "'I'm not satisfied,' Janet Raymond retorted furiously. "'She's just the sort that would harbor a grudge for years, and then all hopped up with dope.' "'Stop it, Janet!' Lois Dunlap commanded with a curtness that set oddly upon her kind, pleasant face. "'Listen here, Dundee,' Tracy Miles broke in, almost humbly. "'My wife is getting pretty anxious about the kiddies. The nurse quit on us yesterday, and—' "'And my little wife is worrying herself sick over our boy, just three months old,' Judge Marshall joined the protest. "'I'm all for assisting justice, sir, having served on the bench myself, as you doubtless know, but—' "'I'm all right, really, Hugo,' Karen Marshall faltered. "'Please be patient a little longer,' Dundee urged apologetically. "'After all, only one of these people could be guilty of Nita Selim's murder, and it was beastly to have to hold them like this. But one was guilty.' "'You knew Mrs. Selim in New York, Sprague?' he asked, whirling suddenly upon the man with the Broadway stamp. I met Nita Lay, as I always heard her called, when I was assistant director in the Altamont Studios out on Long Island, Sprague answered, his black eyes trying to meet Dundee's with an air of complete frankness. Wonderful little girl, and a great dancer. Screened damn well, too. I had hoped to give her a break some day, at something better than doubling for stars who can't dance. But it happened that Nita, who never forgot even a casual friend, had a chance to give me a leg up herself a chance to show what I can really do with a camera. "'I knew I'd seen your name somewhere,' Dundee exclaimed. "'So you're the man the Chamber of Commerce is dickering with. Going to make a movie of the founding growth and beauties of the city of Hamilton, aren't you?' "'If I get the contract, yes,' Sprague answered with palpably assumed modesty. "'My plans, naturally, call for a great deal of research work, a large expenditure of money, a very careful selection of stars.' "'I see.' Dundee interrupted. Then his tone changed, became slow and menacing in its terrible emphasis. And you really couldn't let even a good friend like Nita Selim upset those fine plans of yours, could you, Sprague? Even as he put the sinister question, the detective was exulting to himself. Light at last! Now I know why this Broadway bounder was received into an exclusive crowd like this. Every last female in the bunch hoped to be the star of Sprague's motion picture. "'I don't know what you're driving at, Dundee.' Sprague was on his feet, his black eyes blazing out of a chalky face. "'If you're accusing me of—of—of of, of killing Nita Selim?' Dundee asked lazily. "'Oh, no, not yet, Sprague. I was just remembering a rather puzzling note of yours I happened to read this afternoon. That note you sent by special messenger to break away in this noon, you know.' He had little interest for the sudden crumpling of Dexter Sprague into the chair from which he had risen. Instead, as Dundee drew the note from his coat pocket, his eyes swept around the room, noted the undisguised relief on every face, the almost ghoulish satisfaction with which that close-knit group of friends seized upon an outsider as the probable murderer of that other outsider whom they had rashly taken into their sacred circle. Even Penny Crane, thorny little stickler for fair play that she was, relaxed with a tremulous sigh. You admit that this note, signed by what I take to be your pet name, was written by your hand, Sprague? Dundee asked, matter-of-factly, as he extended the sheet of bluish notepaper. I know. Yes, I wrote it. 
Sprague faltered. But it doesn't mean a thing, not a damn thing. Just a little private matter between Nita and myself. Rather queer wording for an unimportant message, Sprague, Dundee interrupted. Let me refresh your memory. Nita, my sweet, he began to read slowly. Forgive your bad boy for last night's row, but I must warn you again to watch your step. You've already gone too far. Of course I love you and understand, but be good, baby, and you won't be sorry, Dexy. Well, Sprague? Sprague wiped his perspiring hands on his handkerchief. I know it sounds odd under the circumstances, he admitted desperately. But listen, Dundee, and I'll try to make that damn note as clear as possible to a man who doesn't know his Broadway. Why, man, it isn't even a love letter. Everybody on Broadway talks and writes to each other like that without meaning a thing. As I told you, Nita Lay or Mrs. Selim remembered some little kindnesses I had done her on the ultimate lot. When they got her up to take that little theater work Mrs. Dunlap is interested in, and she found that the Chamber of Commerce was interested in putting Hamilton into the movies in a big booster campaign. She wired me, and I thought it looked good enough to drop everything and come. Of course Nita and I got to be closer friends, but I swear to God we were just friends. And what was the friendly row about last night, Sprague? That wasn't a row, really, Sprague protested with desperate earnestness. It was merely that Nita insisted on my casting her for the heroine of the movie, a thing I knew would alienate the whole crowd that's been so kind to us. Why, since she was a professional actress? Dundee demanded. Because she isn't a Hamilton girl, of course. And the Chamber of Commerce wants the cast to be all local talent, Sprague answered, lapsing unconsciously into the present tense. And just what were you warning her against? I told her before to watch her step, Sprague went on more easily. You see, Dundee, Nita Lay is, was, a first-class little vamp, and I could see she was playing her cards with the men here. He indicated four of Hamilton's most prominent Chamber of Commerce members with a wave of his hand to get them all so crazy about her that they'd vote for her as the star of the picture. I could see her point, all right. It would have been a big chance for her to show how she could act. Well, I could see it was dangerous business. And that the girls, and he smiled jerkily at the tense women in the living room, were getting pretty wrought up over the way Nita was behaving. All except Mrs. Dunlap, he added. She didn't want to be in the picture, and Nita didn't make any headway at all with Peter Dunlap. Thanks, Mr. Sprague. Lois Dunlap drawled, with an amused quirk of her broad mouth. "'Get along with the row, Sprague,' Dundee commanded impatiently. "'As I said, it wasn't really a row. I just pleaded with Nita last night to smooth down the girl's rumpled feathers, and to make it clear to them that she didn't want the star part in the picture any more than she wanted any other woman's husband or sweetheart. Just a friendly warning.' Sprague drew a deep breath. "'And that's all the note meant. Absolutely.' I see, Dundee said quietly, then quoted, Be good, baby, and you won't be sorry. That meant, of course, Sprague took him up eagerly, that I'd see she got a real part in a regular movie, after I'd made my hit with the Hamilton picture. Very plausible, very plausible indeed, Dundee reflected, and yet... Finally he lifted his head and let his eyes dart from face to face. All of you have stated, separately and collectively, that you heard no shot fired in Nita Selim's bedroom this afternoon, he said sharply. Is that true? He was answered by weary nods or sullen affirmations. Then, he continued, I must conclude that you are all lying, or that Nita Selim was killed with a gun equipped with a Maxim silencer. Never was a detective more unprepared for the effect of his words upon a group of possible suspects then was Special Investigator Dundee. End of Chapter 9《Chapter 10 of Murder at Bridge》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Murder at Bridge》by Anne Austin Chapter 10 as Dexter Sprague had glibly and plausibly explained away every sinister aspect of the note he had written to Nita Selim that day, Special Investigator Dundee was recalling with verbatim vividness his argument with Captain Strawn of the Homicide Squad immediately after his arrival into the house of violent death. He then said, The person who killed Nita Selim was so well known to her, 
and his or her presence in this room so natural a thing, that she paid no attention to his or her movements, and was concentrating on the job of powdering her very pretty face. And he had said further, in the face of the disappearance of the gun, and in explanation of the fact that all twelve of these people had immediately protested to Strawn, that they had heard no shot. This was a premeditated murder, of course. The maxim silencer, unless they are all lying about not hearing a shot, proves that. Silencers are damned hard to get hold of, but people with plenty of money can manage most things. And, as Dexter Sprague had talked on, more and more glibly, Dundee had suddenly found an explanation which fitted his own argument with such perfection that he wondered, naively, if he were perhaps gifted with clairvoyance. Of all these twelve people whom he had questioned so relentlessly, only Dexter Sprague could have easily come into possession of a maxim silencer. He had dilated proudly upon the fact that he had been an assistant director at the Altamont Studios on Long Island, and the Altamont Company had recently finished making a series of underworld motion pictures, crook dramas featuring gunmen with rods made eerily noiseless by maxim silencers. A bit of information he had picked up in a motion picture magazine had hurtled into the logical chain of Dundee's reasoning. Assistant directors were in charge of props. It was their business to see that no article needed for the production of a picture was lost or missing when the director needed it. Dexter Sprague had said that he had dropped everything to come when Nita Selene wired him of the Chamber of Commerce project to make a booster movie of Hamilton. Perhaps he had dropped everything, but had he hesitated long enough to pick up a Maxim silencer and a blunt-nosed automatic? And was the row which Sprague had been so glibly explaining away in an ancient tone a row so deadly that, when Nita Selim had refused to heed his written warning, her murder had become necessary? It was with all this in mind that Bonnie Dundee flung his challenge. I must conclude that you are all lying, or that Nita Selim was killed with a gun equipped with a Maxim silencer. And his eyes, terrible with their command that the weakling should break and confess, were upon Dexter Sprague. But Sprague did not break. He stared back blankly. If his eyes and his attention had included the whole group, it is possible that what happened would have not have taken Dundee so completely by surprise. He had paid little attention to a sort of concerted gasp, a slight movement among the group farthest from him. But not even his intense concentration upon Sprague could prevent his hearing Karen Marshall's childish voice, tremulous with fear. No, no, Hugo, don't, don't! He whirled from Sprague in time to see Judge Marshall disengaging his arm from his young wife's clinging fingers, to note with profound astonishment that Drake was stepping hastily aside, so that not even his coat sleeve might be brushed by the advancing figure of the elderly retired judge. And before Judge Marshall had time to speak, Dundee saw that a blight had touched, at last, the solid friendship of the women, that they did not look at each other with that air of standing together whatever happened, but that their eyes, not meeting at all, became secret, calculating, afraid. Sir, Judge Marshall began pompously, when he had planted himself squarely before the young detective, it shall never be said of me that I have tried, even in the slightest way, to hamper the course of justice. I am sure of that, Judge Marshall, Dundee replied courteously, but his pulses were hammering. What in God's name did this long-winded old fool have to tell him? You have some information you believe may be valuable, Judge? I do not believe it will be at all valuable, sir. On the contrary, the old man retorted indignantly but to suppress the fact that this juncture might lead to grave misunderstandings later, when it inevitably comes to light. So, sir, it is my duty to inform you that I myself own a Colt's thirty-two, as well as a Maxim silencer. What? Dundee exclaimed incredulously. He was conscious that, behind him, Captain Strawn was getting to his feet. There is no need to get your handcuffs, Captain Strawn, Judge Marshall warned him majestically. I assure you that I have not violated the law. Every judge, active and retired, is entitled to a permit to carry a weapon, and I long ago availed myself of the privilege. Nor am I about to make a confession of murder. There ain't no permit, so far as I know, Judge, Strawn growled, for any man, whoever he may be, God Almighty himself not accepted, to tote a gun with a silencer on it. Karen Marshall was crying now, with the abandoned grief of a petted child. "'Granted, Captain,' Judge Marshall snapped. 
but it happens that I do not tote my gun with the silencer on it. If it interests you, I may as well explain that I came by the silencer several years ago, when I was on the bench. A notorious Chicago gunman, on trial for murder here, and acquitted by a feeble-minded jury, made me a present of the very silencer he had used in killing his victim, an ironic gesture, a gesture of supreme insolence, but an entirely safe gesture, since he well knew that a man once acquitted of a crime cannot again be placed in jeopardy for the same offense. "'So you kept the silencer as a curiosity, Judge Marshall?' Dundee interrupted the pompous flow of rhetoric. "'For years, yes,' the ex-judge answered, then his face went yellow and very old. "'As I told you just now, I will withhold no fact that may be of any relevance whatever. About two months ago, in March, I believe, our little group here took up target shooting as a fad. Several of us became quite expert with revolver and rifle. Mr. Drake, and he nodded toward the banker, who instantly averted his eyes, conceived the idea of practicing the draw-from-the-hip sort of revolver shooting the kind one sees in Wild West movies, you know. I think you might add, Hugo, Drake cut in angrily, that I had in mind the hope of being able to protect the bank in case of a hold-up. And the silencer, Judge Marshall? Captain Strawn prodded. Judge Marshall flushed and fingered the end of a waxed moustache. The silencer, sir, was my wife's idea. You see, sir, we are fortunate enough to be the parents of an infant son. He was just a month old when I painted a bull's-eye upon the brick wall of our back garden, and invited our friends to indulge their fad as our guests. The shooting awakened the baby so frequently that Karen, Mrs. Marshall, dug up the silencer which I had shown her as a memento of my career on the bench. Thereafter we confined our practice almost exclusively to drawing from the hip and shooting without sighting. It is impossible to sight with a gun equipped with the silencer, you know, since the silencer covers the sighter on the barrel. It sure does, Strawn drawled. So every last one of you folks had a good deal of this sort of practice, I take it? Judge Marshall glanced about the room, as if he could not recall the face of everyone present. Yes, all of us, except Mr. Sprague, and Penny, my dear, did you join us at all? The girl who had once been in on every sport that this crowd of Hamilton socially elect indulged in flushed a painful red. No, Hugo, I, I have to stay with Mother on Sunday mornings, you know. Your target practice was on a Sunday morning diversion, then? Judge Marshall, Dundee asked. Yes, we usually have an hour of the sport, between eleven and noon on Sundays. We've been having a sort of tournament, quite sharply competitive, "'When did you and your friends practice last?' Dundee asked. "'Last Sunday. Tomorrow was to mark the end of the tournament,' the judge answered. "'And when did you last see your gun and silencer?' Dundee persisted. "'Last Sunday, of course.' "'Why, good Lord!' Marshall ejaculated. "'It was Nita herself who put the gun away!' There was a collective gasp of relief. Eyes could meet eyes, now. But it was Flora Miles who voiced the thought or hope that seemed apparent on every face." "'That's why I didn't hear anyone talking when I was in the closet,' she cried, her voice almost hysterical in its vehemence. "'There wasn't anybody but Nita in the room. She committed suicide. She stole poor Hugo's gun and the silencer and committed suicide.' "'At a distance of from ten to fifteen feet?' Dundee asked, with ill-concealed sarcasm. "'And when she was powdering her face, and just after entering the room, blithely singing a Broadway hit?' "'Maybe the lady is right, boy.' Captain Strawn interposed mildly. I've heard of people rigging up contrivances. Which make the gun and the silencer disappear by magic? Dundee demanded. No, folks, I'm afraid the suicide theory is no good. Now Judge Marshall, and he turned again to the creator of the biggest sensation since the investigation into Nita Salim's death had got under way. You say that Mrs. Salim herself put the gun away? Will you explain the circumstances? The elderly man's face had gone yellowish again. Certainly. Nita Salim and I were the last to leave the back garden. She was particularly poor at the sport, never made a bull's-eye during the four or five Sunday mornings after Lois, Mrs. Dunlap, drew her into our set. She begged for a few more shots, and I stayed with her after the others had gone into the house for, uh, refreshment. She fired the last bullet in the chamber of the colts, and together we walked into the house, entering the little room at the rear where all sorts of sports equipment are kept, fishing rods and tackle, golf clubs, bows and arrows, skis, etc. 
She was carrying the gun, unscrewing the silencer as we walked. It is my habit to keep the pistol and the silencer in a drawer in a little corner cupboard. Locked up? Dundee asked sharply. Usually locked, but not always, I am afraid, Judge Marshall answered reluctantly. And you saw Mrs. Selim place the gun and the silencer in the drawer? I thought I did, but I was not really watching closely. As a matter of fact, I stopped to look over a fishing rod, with a view to trying it out the first good fishing weather. Was Mrs. Selim wearing a coat or cloak? Dundee cut in impatiently. Why, I don't know. Yes, she was, Hugo, Karen cried out eagerly. It was quite chilly last Sunday morning, remember? We all had on coats or sweaters. Nita wore a dark green leather jacket with big pockets, and she left in a great hurry without even waiting for a drink. Flora Miles contributed triumphantly. I tell you, she took them away in her pockets. Your guess may be correct, Mrs. Miles, Dundee agreed, but I think we had better not come to any definite conclusion until we know that Judge Marshall's automatic and silencer are really missing. Is there anyone at your house now, Judge, whom you can ask to look for it? Certainly. The butler. Shall I telephone him? Accompanied by Captain Strawn, the ex-judge went to the telephone in the little foyer between Nita Selim's bedroom and the main hall. And within five minutes he was back, nodding his head gravely. Henson tells me that the colts and the silencer are both missing, sir. May I express my profound regret that my possession of— Some other time, Judge Marshall, Dundee interrupted curtly, and hurried from the room, followed by Strawn, who nodded to Sergeant Turner, still lounging wearily in a far corner of the living-room, to stand guard vigilantly. "'Well, Bonnie, here's the devil to pay,' Strawn gloomed, but Dundee made for the telephone without answering. He called a number, then curtly demanded, "'Dr. Price, please.' "'Yes, I know he's busy on an autopsy. Just tell him that Dundee, of the district attorney's office, wants to speak with him.' There was a long pause, then, "'Hello, Dr. Price. Dundee. What are the caliber and type of bullet that killed Nita Selim? "'Thanks much, doctor. Anything new?' Fine. Thanks again. He hung up the receiver and faced Strawn. Bullet from a Colt's thirty-two, he said grimly. I suggest you send one of your men around to the Marshall home to pick up a bullet that was shot in their damned target practice. If you send the two bullets tonight, registered mail, to Wright, the ballistics expert in Chicago, he can probably wire you tomorrow morning as to whether the same gun was used to fire both. Sure, Bonnie, Strawn agreed lugubriously. I was going to do just that. Say, this town is getting to be worse than Chicago. When he re-entered the living room, Dundee began upon the judge again, regardless of the fact that the elderly husband was murmuring consolatory endearments to his young wife. Judge Marshall, how many keys are there to the cupboard drawer in which your gun and silencer were kept? Just one. I have it with me, the old man answered wearily. Then when Henson, your butler, looked for them, he found the drawer unlocked? He did. I confess to almost criminal negligence. Then, so far as you know, the gun and silencer could have been removed at any time by any guest of yours between noon last Sunday and today? Dundee went on relentlessly. I suppose so. But these people have been my close friends for years, the judge answered. Not one of them, sir. After Mrs. Selim's departure last Sunday, did your other guests remain for any length of time? For an hour or more, I think. Lois and Peter Dunlap remained for our two o'clock Sunday dinner, but the others drifted away to various engagements. Did any of you return to the room where the gun was kept? I can speak only for myself and Peter, Mr. Dunlap, Judge Marshall answered, flushing with indignation. The two of us went down just before dinner was served. I wanted to show him some new flies for trout casting. Your home is a popular rendezvous for your intimates, is it not? I pride myself that it is, sir. And guests run in and out, having the freedom of the place? Certainly, sir, and since I am not so stupid as you imagine, I can tell you now that I understand the drift of your questions, and can forestall them. Yes, all of these people, my friends, have had opportunity to take the gun and silencer from the cupboard since it was placed there last Sunday, if it was placed there by Mrs. Selim. But may I remind you, sir, that opportunity alone is not sufficient, that motive— since Mrs. Selim is dead, murdered by the weapon which was stolen, we can assume, Judge Marshall, that someone had motive, Dundee reminded him implacably, for in his mind there was no doubt that the ballistics expert would bear him out. 
there was a heavy, throbbing silence, with the exception of Dexter Sprague, had been so united, so cemented with long-sustained friendship, again dissolved visibly before Dundee's eyes into eleven individuals, each shrinking into himself, mentally drawing away from any possible contamination with a murderer. "'You have said, Judge Marshall,' Dundee went on at last, "'that Miss Crane and Mr. Sprague were not at your home for target practice Sunday. Has either of them been in your home during this past week? Penny, Miss Crane, spent an evening with my wife when I was, uh, away from home on business. That was last Tuesday, I believe. Yes, it was Tuesday, Hugo, Penny Crane interrupted firmly, and Karen can vouch for the fact that I did not go into the gun-room. Don't be silly, Penny, Carolyn Drake scolded, as if she had long been bursting to speak, giving an alibi, as if any of us who were playing bridge while that woman was being shot needs any alibi. But I'll tell you what I think, Mr. Detective. I think Nita herself stole the gun in the silencer to kill Dexter Sprague with, and that he stole it from her and murdered her. Nobody else has the slightest scrap of a motive, and that note he wrote her ought to be enough to hang him on. Dexter Sprague had struggled to his feet during the woman's hysterical attack, his face like chalk, his eyes blazing. But Dundee waved him aside peremptorily. One more question, Judge Marshall, he said suavely, as if he had not heard a word that Carolyn Drake had said. You knew Mrs. Selim before her arrival in Hamilton with Mrs. Dunlap, I believe. Just when and where did you meet her? End of chapter 10《of Murder at Bridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Murder at Bridge by Anne Austin. Chapter 11. You are damned impertinent, sir, Judge Marshall shouted, the ends of his waxed gray mustache trembling with anger. Then I take it that you do not wish to divulge the circumstances of your friendship with Mrs. Selim? Friendship? the old man snorted. Your implications, sir, are dastardly. I met Mrs. Selim, or rather, Nita Lee, as she was introduced to me, only once, several years ago, when I was in New York. Naturally— Just a moment, Judge. You say she was introduced to you as Nita Lee. Then you knew her as an actress, I presume? I refuse to submit to such a cowardly attack, sir. Attack, Judge? Dundee repeated with assumed astonishment. I merely thought you might be able to shed a little light on the past of the woman who has been murdered here to-day, with a weapon you admit to having owned. However, the elderly ex-judge stared at his tormentor for a moment, as if murder was in his heart. He gasped twice, then suddenly his whole manner changed. I apologize, Dundee. You must realize how, but that is beside the point. I met Nita Lee at, uh, a social gathering, arranged by some New York friends of mine. She was young, attractive, more refined than, uh, the average young woman in musical comedy. Naturally, I told her if she ever was in Hamilton to look me up, and she did. And because she was more refined than the average young woman in musical comedy, than the average chorus girl, to put it simply, Dundee took him up, you cooperated with Mrs. Dunlap to introduce her to your most intimate friends, including your wife? Oh, Hugo, why didn't you tell me? Karen Marshall wailed. "'You see, sir, what you are doing,' Judge Marshall stormed. "'I am truly sorry if I have distressed you, Mrs. Marshall,' Dundee protested sincerely. "'But,' he shrugged and turned again to the husband, "'I understand you were Mrs. Selim's landlord. May I ask how much rent she paid?' "'The house rents for one hundred dollars a month, furnished.' "'And did Mrs. Selim pay her rent promptly?' Dundee persisted. Since this is the 24th of May, sir, Mrs. Selim's rent for June was not yet due. Not before poor little Karen could Dundee force himself to ask what, inevitably, would have been his next question, one which could not have been evaded, as the ex-judge had evaded the other two questions. Is it not true, Judge Marshall, that Nita Lee Selim paid you no rent at all? But there were other ways to find out. "'Look here, Dundee,' a brusque voice challenged, and the detective whirled to face Polly Beale. It was like her, he thought with a slight grin, to address him as one man to another. "'Yes, Miss Beale?' "'I'm no fool, and I don't think any of my friends here are either. 
though two or three of them have acted like it to-day, the masculine-looking girl stated flatly. You've made it very plain that any one of us here, except the Sprague man, could have stolen Hugo's gun and silencer. Has the gun been found? It has not, Miss Beale. Okay, the queer girl snapped her fingers. I move that you or Captain Strawn search the men for the weapon, and that I search the women. Wait, she harshly stopped a flurry of feminine protests. I'll ask you, Dundee, to search me first, yourself. I believe the technical term is frisking, isn't it? Then frisk me. Here is my handbag. I wore no coat, except this, and she pointed to the jacket of her tweed suit. As she strode toward the detective, Clive Hammond sprang after her with an oath and a sharp command. Shut up, Clive. I'm not married to you yet, she retorted, but her eyes were gentler than her voice. His face burning with embarrassment, Dundee went through the traditional gestures of police frisking, running his hands rapidly down the girl's tall, sturdy body, slapping her pockets, and his fingers fumbled sadly as he opened her tooled leather handbag. Satisfied? Polly Beale demanded, and at Dundee's miserable nod, the girl faced her friends. Well, come along, girls. Lord, what a girl! Dundee muttered to Strawn, as the young Amazon herded Flora Miles, Penny Crane, Karen Marshall, Carolyn Drake, Lois Dunlap, and Janet Raymond into the dining room. Silently and almost meekly, as if shamed into submission by Polly Beale's example, John Drake, Tracy Miles, Clive Hammond, Judge Marshall, and Dexter Sprague permitted Captain Strawn and Sergeant Turner to search them. How about the guest closet and the cars? Dundee asked of Strawn in a low voice, when the fruitless, unpleasant task was finished. Gone over with a fine-tooth comb long ago, Strawn assured him gloomily, and not a hiding place in or outside the house that the boys haven't poked into, including the meadow as far as any one could throw from the bedroom window. The women were filing back into the room, some pale, some flushed, but all able to look each other in the eye again. With surprising jauntiness, Polly Beale saluted Dundee. Nothing more deadly on any of us than Flora's triple-deck compact. I thank you with all my heart, Miss Beale, Dundee said sincerely, and now I think you may all go to your homes. Of course you understand, he interrupted a chorus of relieved ejaculations, that all of you will be wanted for the inquest, which will probably be held Monday. And what's more, Captain Strawn cut in, to show his authority, I want all of you to hold yourselves ready for further questioning at any time. There was a stampede for coats and hats, a rush for cars as if the house were on fire, or, Dundee reflected wryly, as if those he had tortured were afraid he would change his mind, rushing away with hatred of him in their hearts. Only Penny Crane held back, maneuvering for a chance to speak with him. "'I don't have to go with the rest, do I?' she begged in a husky whisper. "'And why not?' Dundee grinned at her, but he was glad there was no hatred in her eyes. I'm attached to the district attorney's office, too, aren't I? Right, and you've been a brick this evening. I don't know what I should have done without you. Well, I can't see that you've done much with me, she jibed. But I'd like to stick around, if you're going to do some real Sherlocking. Can't be done, Penny. I want to stay here alone for a while and mull things over. But I'd like to have a long talk with you tomorrow. Come to Sunday dinner. Mother loves murder mysteries, she suggested. Then realization swept over her her brown eyes widened, filled with terror. Stop thinking one of us did it. Stop, I tell you. Can you stop, Penny? he asked gently. But she fled from him, sobbing wildly for the first time that long, horrible evening. Dundee, watching from the doorway of the lighted hall, saw the chauffeur open the rear door of the Dunlap limousine, saw Penny catapult herself into Lois Dunlap's outstretched arms, "'When did the Dunlap chauffeur call for his mistress?' he asked Strawn, who stood beside him. "'About ten minutes after you arrived,' Strawn answered wearily. "'Said he'd dropped Mrs. Dunlap and the Selene woman about two-thirty, and had been ordered to return around six-thirty. Knows nothing, of course.' The chief of the homicide squad drew a deep breath. "'Well, Bonnie, he has nothing on me. In spite of all the palaver, I don't know nothing either.' "'You need some dinner, chief,' Dundee suggested, "'and the boys must be getting hungry, too.' "'Somebody's got to guard the house, I suppose,' Strawn gloomed. "'Not that it will do any good. And what about that maid, that car woman? Shall I lock her up on general principles?' "'No. I want to have another talk with her, and if she bucks at spending the night here, I'll take her to the Rhodes' house, and turn her over to my old friend, Mother Rhodes. 
We haven't anything on her, you know. No, nor on anybody else, except that old fool Marshall, and we can't clap him into jail yet, Strawn agreed, his gray eyes twinkling. Take your crew on in, chief, Dundee urged. I'll stick till midnight or longer, if you don't mind. You can arrange to have a couple of the boys to relieve me about twelve. And by the way, will you telephone me the minute you get hold of Ralph Hammond? Well, maybe not so quick as that, Strawn drawled. I'll take the first crack at that baby, my lad. Not so dumb, am I, bonny boy? Not so dumb. I can put two and two together as well as the next one. Pretty near as well as the district attorney's new special investigator. Although Bonnie Dundee had taken Captain Strawn's none too gentle parting jibe with good grace, it was a very thoughtful young detective who set about locking himself into the house in which Nita Selim had been murdered. Captain Strawn had beaten him to the job that evening by at least twenty minutes. Had the old detective stumbled upon something which Dundee, for all his spectacular thoroughness, had overlooked, or been unable to turn up because Strawn had suppressed it? What if Strawn's parting boast was not an idle one, and he really had the goods on Ralph Hammond? Had the old chief been laughing up his sleeve during the farce of playing out the death hand at Bridge, and during the merciless quizzing of old Judge Marshall? But Dundee's native common sense quickly routed his gloom. Captain Strawn was too direct in his methods, too afraid of antagonizing the rich and influential, to have permitted even a special investigator from the district attorney's office to torment those twelve people needlessly. Probably Strawn, feeling a little hurt at having played second fiddle all evening, had simply wanted to get him fussed, was even now chuckling over the effect of his parting boast. Much cheered, Dundee lingered in the dining-room whose windows he had made fast against any intrusion, so that his task of guarding the house alone might be minimized. As he glanced at the table, with its silver plates heaped up with tiny sandwiches of caviar and anchovy paste, its little silver boats of olives and sweet pickles, he discovered that he was very hungry indeed. As he munched the drying sandwiches and sipped charged water, the various liquors for cocktails on the sideboard offered a temptation which he sternly resisted. Dundee's thought boiled and churned, throwing up picture after picture of Nita Selim, alive and then dead, of Penny Crane, bless her, helping him at the expense of her loyalty to lifelong friends, of Flora Miles, lying desperately, then confessing to a shameful theft, of Karen Marshall gallantly playing out the death hand, of Karen's stricken, childish face when she learned that her elderly husband had met, and at least flirted with Nita Selim, at a chorus girl's party. At that last picture Dundee flushed so that his skin prickled. Had he made a fool of himself, or was he right in his suspicion that Hugo Marshall had given Nita Selim this cottage rent-free? That point should be easily settled at any rate. Ruefully reflecting that appetizers do not make a satisfactory meal, he betook himself to the dead woman's bedroom. Yes, his memory had served him well. Here was her desk, a small feminine affair of rosewood, set in the corner of the room nearest the porch door. The desk was not locked. As Dundee let down the slanting lid, whose polish was marred with many fingerprints, he saw that its contents were in a hopeless jumble. So Strawn had beaten him to this, too. Had he found an all-important clue in one of the many little pigeonholes and drawers, stuffing it into his pocket just before a bumptious young special investigator had arrived? But Dundee's returning gloom was instantly dispelled. Here was Nita's checkbook, a flutter of filled-in stubs attached to only one remaining blank check. So Nita had banked with the Hamilton National Bank, of which John C. Drake, who apparently hated his faddish, fussy wife, was a vice-president. Another tiny fact to be tucked away. She had opened her account, apparently, on April 21, the day of her arrival in Hamilton, the guest and employee of Mrs. Peter Dunlap. Probably Lois Dunlap had advanced her the two hundred dollars as first payment for her prospective work in organizing a little theater movement in Hamilton. Turning rapidly through Stubbs, Dundee stopped twice, whistling softly with amazement each time. For on April 28th, and again on May 5th, Nita Selim had deposited five thousand dollars. Where had she gotten the money? Were the sums transfers from accounts in New York banks? 
but it was hardly likely that a little Broadway hanger-on had so much hard cash on deposit. Then where had she gotten it? Five thousand dollars at a time, here in Hamilton. Blackmail. Hastily but thoroughly, Dundee ran through the remaining check stubs. No record at all of a check for rent made out to Judge Hugo Marshall. But there was a stub that interested him. Check number seventeen, Nita had spent her money lavishly, was filled in as follows, in Nita's pretty backhand. Number seventeen, nine thousand dollars, May nine, nineteen thirty, to trust department, for investment. Had John C. Drake, who, as vice president in charge of trusts and investments, had doubtless handled the check, wondered at all where the nine thousand dollars had come from? One other revelation came out of the twenty-three filled-in stubs. On every Monday, Nita Salim had drawn a check for forty dollars to her maid, Lydia Carr. Again Dundee whistled. Forty dollars a week was, he wagered to himself, more money than any other maid in Hamilton was lucky enough to receive. Nita in a new light, an over-generous Nita. Or was Nita herself paying blackmail on a small scale? He reached into a pigeonhole whose contents, a thick packet of unused envelopes, had not been disturbed by Strong, and was about to remove an envelope in which to place the all-important check-book, when he noticed something slightly peculiar. An envelope in the middle of the packet looked rather thicker than an empty case should. But it was not empty, and across the face of the expensive, cream-colored linen paper was written, in that same pretty, very legible backhand, to be opened in case of my death. Juanita Lee Selim. His heart hammering painfully, and his fingers trembling, Dundee drew out the two close-written sheets of creamy note-paper. After all, who had better right than he to open it? Was he not the representative of the district attorney? And he hadn't damaged the envelope. It had opened very easily indeed. Its flap had yielded instantly to his thumbnail. Wait! It had been too easy. Before unfolding the letter, or whatever it was, Dundee examined the flap of the envelope. Yes, he was not the first to open it since its original sealing. God grant he hadn't destroyed any tell-tale fingerprints in his criminal haste to learn any secret that Nita Selim had recorded here. Perhaps Nita herself had unsealed the letter to make an addition or a correction. Well, whatever damage had been done was done now, and he might as well read. Five minutes later Bonnie Dundee was racing through the dining-room, pushing open the swinging door that led into the butler's pantry. Where the devil were the steps that led down into the basement? A precious minute was lost before he discovered that a door in the dark back hall opened upon the steep steps. An unshaded light, dangling from the ceiling, revealed the furnace in one corner of the big basement, laundry equipment in another. He plunged on. That must be the maid's room, behind that closed door. God! What if she had escaped while he had been munching caviar and anchovy sandwiches? A fine guard he'd have been and he wasn't as if he hadn't had a dim suspicion of the truth. The knob turned easily. He flung open the door, and then his knees nearly gave way, so tremendous was his relief. For there, on the thin mattress of a white enameled iron bed, lay the woman he so ardently desired to see. She had apparently been asleep, and the noise he had made had startled her into panicky wakefulness. Instinctively her hand flew to the ruined left side of her face, that hideous expanse of livid flesh, scarred and ridged, so that it did not look human. What? Who? Lydia Carr gasped, struggling into a sitting position, only to fall back as nausea swept over her. You remember me? Dundee panted. Dundee of the district attorney's office? I questioned you this afternoon. The woman closed the single eye that had escaped the accident which had marred her face so hideously. I remember. I'm sick. I told you all I know. Lydia, why didn't you tell me that it was your mistress, Mrs. Selim, who did that? Dundee demanded sternly, pointing to the woman's sightless left eye and ruined cheek. End of chapter 11
Lydia Carr, still clothed in the black cotton dress and white apron of her maid's uniform, struggled to a sitting position on the edge of her basement room bed. No. No. That's a lie. It was an accident, I tell you. My own fault. Who dared to say Nita? Miss Nita did it. Better lie down, Lydia, Dundee suggested gently. I won't want you feigning. You've had a hard day with the abscess tooth the dope the dentist gave you, and other things. I don't wonder that you lost your head, went a little crazy, perhaps. The detective's sinister implication seemed to make no impression at all upon the woman with the scarred face. I asked you, she gasped, her single eye glaring at him, who dared say Nita burned me? It was Nita herself who told me, Dundee answered softly, just a few minutes ago. Holy mother! The maid gasped and crossed herself dazedly. Let her think the dead woman had appeared to him in a vision, Dundee told himself. Perhaps her confession would come the quicker. The maid began to rock her gaunt body, her arms crossed over her flat chest. My poor little girl! Even in death she thinks of me. She's sorry. She sent me a message, didn't she? Tell me! She was always trying to comfort me, sir. The poor little thing couldn't believe I'd forgiven her as soon as she'd done it. Tell me. Yes, Dundee agreed, his eyes watching her keenly. She sent you a message, of a sort, but I can't give it to you until you have told me all about the accident in which you were burned. I'll tell, Lydia promised eagerly. Gone were the harshness and secretiveness with which she had met his earlier questioning. You see, sir, I loved Miss Nita. I called her Nita, if you don't mind, sir. I loved her like she was my own child, and she was fond of me, too. Fonder of me than of anybody in the world, she used to tell me, when some man had hurt her bad. And there was always some man or other. She was so sweet and so pretty. Well, I found her in the bathroom one day, just ready to drink carbolic acid to kill her poor little self. When was that, Lydia? Dundee interrupted. It was in February, Sunday, the ninth of February, Lydia went on, still rocking in an agony of grief. I tried to take the glass out of her hands. She poured a lot of the stuff out of the bottle. You see, she was already in a fit of hysterics, or she'd never have tried to kill herself. It was my own fault trying to take the glass away from her like I did. She flung the acid into your face, Dundee asked, shuddering. She didn't know what she was doing, the woman cried, glaring at him. Nearly went out of her mind, they told me at the hospital, because she'd hurt me. A private room in the best hospital in New York she got for me, trained nurses night and day, and so many doctors fussing around me, I wanted to fire the whole outfit and save some of my poor girl's money, which I don't know till this day how she got hold of. Dundee let her sob and rock her arms for a while unmolested. In February, Nita Salim had had to borrow money to pay doctor and hospital bills. Had borrowed it, or gold dug it. And in May, she had been rich enough to have $9,000 to invest. Lydia, you never forgave Nita Salim for ruining your life as well as your face, Dundee charged her suddenly. You're a liar, she cried passionately. I know what I felt. It's my face and my life, ain't it? I tell you, I didn't even bear a grudge against her, the poor little thing, eating her heart out with sorrow for what she'd done till the very day of her death, always trying to make it up to me, paying me too much money for the handful of work I had to do, what with her eating out nearly all the time and throwing away stockings the minute they got a run in them. Forgive her? I'd have crawled from here to New York on my hands and knees for Nita Lee. Dundee studied her horribly scarred face, made more horrible now by what looked like genuine grief. Lydia, who was the man over whom your mistress wanted to commit suicide? The single, tear-reddened eye glared at him suspiciously, then became wary. I don't know. Was it Dexter Sprague, Lydia? Sprague? She spat the name out contemptuously. No. She didn't know him then, except to speak to at the moving picture studio. When did he become her lover, Lydia? Dundee asked casually. The woman stiffened, became menacingly hostile. 
Who says he was her lover? You can't trick me, Mr. Detective. I cut my tongue out before I'd let you make me say one word against my poor girl. Dundee shrugged. He knew a stone wall when he ran up against one. Lydia, he began again after a thoughtful pause, I have proof that Nita Selim was sure you had never forgiven her for the injury she did you. His fingers touched the letter in his pocket, that incredible last will and testament which Nita had written the day before she was murdered. And that's another lie, the woman cried, shaking with anger. She struggled to her feet, stood swaying dizzily a moment. Come upstairs with me to her room, and I'll show you some proof that I had forgiven her. Come along, I tell you. Trying to make me say I killed my poor girl when I'd have died for her. Come on, I tell you. And Dundee, wondering, beginning to doubt his own conviction a little, that conviction which had sprung full-grown out of Nita's strange informal will, and which had seemed to explain everything, followed Lydia Carr from her basement room to the bedroom in which Nita had been murdered. See this? And Lydia Carr snatched up the powder box from the dressing table. Her long, bony fingers busied themselves with frantic haste, and suddenly into the silence of the room came the tinkle of music. I bought her this, for a present, out of my own money, soon as I got out of the hospital, the maid's voice shrilled over the slow, sweet, tinkly notes. It's playing her name song, Juanita. It was playing that song when she died. I stood there in the doorway and heard it and she pointed toward the door leading from Nita's room into the back hall. She loved it and used it all the time because I gave it to her. And this! She set the musical powder box upon the dressing table and rushed across the room to one of the several lamps that Dundee had noticed on his first survey of the room. It was the largest and gaudiest of the collection, a huge bowl of filigreed bronze set with innumerable stones as large as marbles or larger red, yellow, and green stones that must have cast a strange radiance over the pretty head that had been wont to lie just beneath it on the heaped lace pillows of the chaise long, Dundee reflected. As if Lydia had read his thoughts, she jerked at the little chain which hung from the bottom of the big bronze bowl against the heavy metal standard. I gave her this, saved up for it out of my own money. She was assuring him with savage triumph in proving her point. And she loved it so she brought it with us when we came from New York. It won't light. It was working all right last night because my poor little girl was lying here looking so pretty under the colored lights. With strong twists of her big hands, Lydia began to unscrew the filigreed bronze bowl. As she lifted it off, she exclaimed blankly, Why, look, the light bulb's broke. But Dundee had already seen not only the broken light bulb, but the explanation of the queer noise that Flora Miles had described hysterically over and over as a bang or a bump. The chaise long stood between the two windows that opened upon the drive, and at the head of it stood the big lamp, just a few inches from the wall, and only a foot from the window frame upon which Dr. Price had penciled the point to indicate the end of the imaginary line along which the shot which killed Nita Lee Selim had traveled. The bang or bump which Flora Miles had heard had been made by the knocking of the big lamp against the wall. Undoubtedly, the one who had bumped into the lamp was Nita's murderer, or murderess, in frantic haste to make an escape. And that meant that the murderer had fled toward the back hall, not through the window in front of which he had stood, not through the door leading onto the front porch. A little progress, at least. But Lydia was not through proving that she had forgiven her mistress. She was snatching things from Nita's clothes closet. See these mules with ostrich feathers? I give them to my girl. And this bed jacket? I embroidered the flowers on it with my own hands. Through her flood of proof, Dundee heard the whir of a car's engine, then the loud banging of a car's door. Running footsteps on the flagstone path, Dundee reached the front door just as the bell pealed shrilly. Hello, Dundee. Awfully glad I caught you before you left. Is poor Lydia still here? Come in, Mr. Miles, Dundee invited, searching with a puzzled frown the round, blonde face of Tracy Miles. Yes, Lydia is still here. Why? Then I'm in luck, and I think Lydia is too, poor old girl. You see, Dundee, Miles began to explain as he took off his new straw hat to mop his perspiring forehead. 
The crowd all ganged up when our various cars reached Sheridan Road, and by unanimous vote we elected to drive over to the country club for a meal in one of the small private dining rooms, to escape the questions of the morbidly curious, you know. Yes, what about it? Dundee interrupted impatiently. Well, I admit we were all pretty hungry in spite of... Well, of course we were all fond of Nita, but... What about Lydia? Dundee cut him short. I'm getting to it, old boy, Miles protested with the injured air of an unappreciated small boy. While we were waiting for our food, somebody said, Poor Lydia, what's to become of her? And somebody else said that it was harder on her, Nita's death, I mean, than on anybody else, because Nita was all she had in the world. And then Lois, Lois is always practical, you know, ran to telephone police headquarters to see what had been done with Lydia, to see if it would be all right for Flora and me to take her home with us. Just a minute, Miles. Whom did Mrs. Dunlap talk to at headquarters? Why, Captain Strawn, of course, Miles answered. He told Lois that you were still out here questioning Lydia again, and that it was all right with him whatever you decided. So as soon as I had finished eating, I drove over. Is Mrs. Miles with you? Dundee interrupted again. Well, no, Miles admitted uncomfortably. You see, the girls felt a little squeamish about coming back, even on an errand of mercy. Dundee grinned. He had no doubt that Flora Miles had emphatically refused the possibility of another grueling interview. "'Why do you and Mrs. Miles want to take Lydia home with you?' he asked. "'To give her a home and a job,' Miles answered promptly. "'She knows us. We're used to her poor old scarred face. And the youngsters, Tam and Betty, are not a bit afraid of her. In fact, Betty pats that scarred cheek and says over and over, "'Poor Liddy, poor Liddy, Betty owes Liddy." And Tam, he's T.A. Miles, Jr., you know, we call him Tam from the initials, because he hates being called Jr., and two traces are a nuisance. I gather that you want to hire Lydia as a nurse for the children, Dundee interrupted the fond father's verbose explanations. Right, old man. You see, our nurse left us yesterday. Wait here, Miles. I'll speak to Lydia. She's in Mrs. Selene's bedroom. By the way, Miles, since you and your wife are kind enough to want to take Lydia in and give her a home and a job, I think it only fair to tell you that it is highly improbable that Lydia Carr will take any job at all. You mean? Miles gasped, his ruddy face turning pale. I say, Dundee, it's absurd to think for a minute that good old faithful Lydia had a thing to do with Nita's murder. I rather think you're right about that, Miles, Dundee interrupted. Now, will you excuse me? He found Lydia where he had left her, in her dead mistress's bedroom. The tall, gaunt woman was crouching beside the chaise long, her arms outstretched to encircle a little pile of the gifts she claimed to have given Nita Selim to prove that she bore no grudge for the terrible injury her mistress had done her. At Dundee's entrance she flung up her head, and the detective saw that tears were streaming from both the sightless eye and the unharmed one. Taking his seat on the chaise long, Dundee explained gently but briefly the offer which Tracy Miles had just made. They want me? She gasped brokenly, incredulously, and her fingers faltered to her horrible cheek. I didn't think anybody but my poor girl would have me around. It is true they want you, Dundee assured her, but you don't have to take a job now unless you wish, Lydia. What do you mean? The maid demanded harshly, her good eye hardening with suspicion. Lydia, the young detective began slowly, and almost praying that he was doing the right thing. When I woke you up tonight to question you, I said that Nita herself had just told me that it was she who had burned your face, and you asked me if she had also given you a message. Yes, sir, the maid interrupted with pitiful eagerness. And you'll tell me now? You don't still think I killed her, do you? No, I don't think you killed your mistress, Lydia. But I think if you would, you could help me find out who did, Dundee assured her gravely. No, wait. And he drew from his pocket the envelope inscribed, To be opened in case of my death, Juanita Lee Salim. Do you recognize this handwriting, Lydia? It was wrote by her own hand, the maid answered, her voice husky with tears. Is that the message, sir? You never saw it before? Dundee asked sharply. No, no. I didn't know my poor girl was thinking about death, Lydia moaned. I thought she was happy here. She was tickled to pieces over being taken up by all them society people, and on the go day and night. 
"'Lydia, this is Mrs. Selim's last will and testament,' Dundee interrupted, withdrawing the sheet slowly and unfolding them. "'It was written yesterday, and it begins, "'Knowing that any of us may die any time, and that I, Juanita Lee Selim, have good cause to fear that my own life hangs by a thread that may break any minute.' "'What did my poor girl mean?' Lydia Carr cried out vehemently. "'She wasn't sick ever!' I think, Lydia, that she feared exactly what happened today. Murder. And I want you to tell me who it was she feared, for I believe you know. The woman shrank from him until she was sitting on her lean haunches, her hands flattening against her cheeks. For a long minute she did not attempt to answer. Her right eye widened enormously, then slowly grew as expressionless as the milky left ball. I don't. No, she said dully. Then, with vehement emphasis, I don't know. If I did, I'd kill him with my own hands. Dundee had no choice but to take her word. You said there was a message for me, Lydia reminded him. I'll read you her will first, Dundee said quietly, lifting the sheets again. I am herewith setting down my last will and testament in my own handwriting. I do here and now solemnly will and bequeath to my faithful and beloved maid, Lydia Carr, all property, including all monies, stocks, and personal belongings, of which I die possessed. To me? Lydia whispered. To me? To you, Lydia, Dundee assured her gravely. Then I can have all her pretty clothes to keep always? and her money to do as you like with, if the court accepts this will for probate, as I think it will, regardless of the fact that it is very informal and was not witnessed. But she didn't have any money, Lydia protested, nothing but what Mrs. Dunlap paid her in advance for the work she was going to do. Lydia, your mistress died possessed of nearly ten thousand dollars. Dundee fixed her bewildered gray eye with his blue ones. Ten thousand dollars! all of which she got right here in Hamilton, and I want you to tell me how she got it. But I don't know. I don't believe she had it. Dundee shrugged. Either this woman would perjure her soul to protect her mistress's name from scandal, or she really knew nothing. That is all of the will itself, Lydia, he went on finally, except her command that her body be cremated without funeral services of any kind, and that nobody be allowed to accompany the remains to the crematory except yourself and Mrs. Peter Dunlap, in case her death takes place in Hamilton. She did love Mrs. Dunlap, Lydia sobbed. Oh, my poor little girl! and there is also a note for you which I took the liberty of reading, in which Mrs. Selim minutely describes the clothes in which she wishes to be cremated, as well as the fashion in which her hair is to be dressed. Let me see it! Lydia plunged forward on her knees and snatched at the papers he held. For God's sake, let me see! End of chapter 12